Well, it is good to be back with you. Um, I don't have any jokes to tell you, like like we heard. Or, well, actually, I do have one. I do have one. Uh, how does Moses make his coffee? All right, he brews it. Okay, he brews it. Yeah. All right. Um, when you go to a Christian college, you pick up a lot of corny Bible jokes that um, that may or may, may or may not be relevant in the real world. Anyway. Um, it is good to be with you again this morning, as, uh, as I just mentioned. It's, it's good to be back and to f- be able to fill in. It's always wonderful to be able to open up the Word of God in, in a setting such as this. So I never take these opportunities for granted, as I always say. So before I start, I just want to do what I always do, and, and I want to just open up with a word of prayer. So uh, let's pray. Gracious Father, You have placed eternity on our hearts. Lord, you have also blessed us with your life-changing truth that you have revealed to us through your most holy word. God, I pray that we may have the boldness to stand on your word in the midst of any opposition or tension or challenge that may come as a result of following you. May we always present your truth in a way that communicates your glory and your gospel in a convicting and life-transforming way. Lord, we pray that you may fill our hearts with your word and your message this morning. We humbly submit to you, Lord, our creator, our God. Amen. I want to open up with a story, and the story really isn't a funny story per se, but it's about an experience I had a few years ago. I happened to, once upon a time, go on a school trip. And before I tell you where that trip was to, I just want to recount to you a experience that we had on our trip that may or may not have been a near-death experience. It wasn't a near-death experience, but it was pretty crazy at the time. So me and about nine or ten other people from, from Grace, we're on this trip and we're walking through this big city. And we're unfamiliar with this city. It's a place we've never been before. So as we're walking through the city, we're on our way back to our hotel, and we come across this circle in the middle of in the middle of the city. And it's like a it's a traffic circle, kind of kind of like monument circle downtown. You kind of come up, it goes in different directions. So we're we're coming up on the city in the circle, and we realize that this is one of the busiest streets in this city. And there's no sidewalks around the circle. But the only way we can get back to our hotel is we literally have to cut across traffic to get to our hotel. And there's nine or ten of us, so you can imagine in your mind what this would have been like. Each, it's like real-life Frogger, right? You're trying to get across the road. Nine or ten people, not once, because it's a circle. You've got to get to the center, and then you've got to cross it again. So getting nine or ten people across safely is probably one of the most miraculous things I've actually ever seen in person. And um, the city that we were in is Athens, Athens, Greece. That's where we were. We, we were on a school trip. We went for 10 days to Turkey and Greece. It's been about three years ago this May. And I have to wonder, I have to imagine what this would have looked like to the, to the people in Athens who are driving in the circle, and they see what is clearly a group of Americans trying to cross the circle. They're probably thinking, these crazy Americans, don't they have anything to do than play in traffic, than play chicken in traffic out here? Like, what are they thinking? Of course, nowadays they're probably thinking this is the same country, the same group of people that have made eating Tide Pods a thing. So if you, if you know about, if you've heard that, it's chaotic, really. Uh, that has nothing to do with the message, but I just wanted to throw out there. I, I keep track of current events, and sometimes I really wish things weren't true. Uh, but that was, um, they actually are starting to lock laundry detergent in stores tonight. You believe that because of that? What a world we live in. Um, but yeah, that... I was in Greece, and and this is just one of many experiences we had, but experiencing the city of Athens firsthand, Athens is a very magnificent city. It's very well known, has a lot of attractions historically, very well-known city of all time. It's been kind of the center of a lot of world history. But my experience in the city of Athens was very chaotic, and it's chaotic because Athens in and of itself is a very chaotic city. That, that would be a good word to use. It, it's true today. It was true three years ago, but it was also true 2,000 years ago. And we're going to see that this morning as we open up the Word of God. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be reading 
out of Acts 17 this morning, and I'm going to be reading it to you since it's Athens, since it's Greece. I'm going to be reading to you in Greek. That's a joke. I'm not going to be reading to you. Some of you are probably like, I'm out of here. I cannot. I'm not going to listen to this guy talking Greek, which is actually the same experience I had when I took Greek. I wanted to get as far away from that as possible. Uh, funny enough story, uh, my, my Greek professor that I had at Grace was actually the faculty leader of this trip. And since I'm kind of ragging on Greek a little bit, I'm going to not give him the link to this sermon. Um, but this professor was a very, very good professor. He's very solid, very, very great guy. Um, and second thought, maybe we can have him listen to that part of the sermon as I compliment him, because I need A's, bad. Uh, that's also a joke. I'm, I don't need. I would never bribe. I would never bribe for a good grade. That is not what I would do. So Acts 17, specifically, we're going to be in 16 through 34 in Acts 17, and we find this passage in the middle of the book of Acts. And if you know anything about the book of Acts, you know it's kind of the foundation. It teaches us about the foundations of the early church. And when we find ourselves in Acts 17, Paul is in the middle of the city of Athens. And before we get to that, let's just, I'm going to take a look back in the book of Acts. A few weeks after his resurrection and just before his ascension, Jesus has the apostles, has his disciples together. And in Acts 1.8, he says the following, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. So this is like the early charge of Jesus to his apostles. This is like the second great commission, if you will. He says, you'll be my witnesses. You'll get the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. And you're going to go out first locally, like where you live. Then you're going to go nationally and ultimately the whole world. And you're going to be witnesses to what I have done. So this is the charge, and following the Holy Spirit coming upon the apostles in Acts chapter 2, the church is effectively started. And the message of Jesus Christ, it begins to spread. So basically, you you see the Holy Spirit, and what the Holy Spirit is doing in the book of Acts is the Holy Spirit is empowering the apostles to go out everywhere in the world and to share what they have seen, what they have experience and what they have learned from Christ and to share that with everyone. They are bold witnesses wherever they go. There's intense persecution that comes along with this. We see all everywhere in the book of Acts. The apostles are either being arrested, they're being ridiculed wherever they go, but there's also mass conversion. We see a lot of people grow to their numbers and add to the church early on. And when you get to Acts 7 and 8, you see a big antagonist to the early church in the name of this person called Saul. Saul is a Jewish leader who, for all intents and purposes, did not like the message that the apostles were spreading about Christ. If you were a Jewish person, Jesus Christ was not the name you wanted to hear because you know, they, they, just, they didn't like the guy, obviously. So Saul is a prominent Jewish leader, and he opposed the message of Christ so staunchly early on that he actually has Stephen, who's one of the earliest witnesses to Christ, has him stoned in Acts, has him killed, basically rendering him a martyr to the church. However, this person, Saul, will ultimately himself be converted in Acts 9, and now we don't know him as Saul anymore. We know him as the Apostle Paul, who is very memorable, very central figure. He wrote a lot of our New Testament, obviously, and we'll see his encounter in Athens in just a moment. He becomes one of the most influential and memorable figures in history, and when we find him in Acts 17, he is central in our passage. So back to Acts 17, Paul's in Athens at this point, as I just mentioned, we had just established that, and it's probably somewhere around the late 40s AD, somewhere around that time. Paul went on a lot of missionary journeys, and a lot of places he hit multiple times. So this particular trek that he was in started in Antioch, which is in present-day Syria. And in Paul's journeys, he would go through Asia into what is now modern-day Turkey, and then into Macedonia, which is now modern-day Greece. He would hit places such as Philippi and Thessalonica, which were very prominent churches at the time. Obviously, we have letters to these people in our New Testament in Philippians and Thessalonians. 
And then he hits this little town, northern Greece, northern Macedonia, called Berea, which is in northern Greece. And then he transitions down to southern Greece, or southern Macedonia, where we find him in Athens. Athens was a premier city. It was one of the world's finest cities. A few hundred years before Paul, it was like the capital of the Greek empire, Alexander the Great. Very prominent, very diverse city historically. It was home to some of the brightest minds in world history. Guys such as Plato, Aristotle, Epicurus, some of these famous philosophers made their home in Athens. It was a magnificent city. Its nickname is actually the Glorious City. I would try to pronounce the Greek word, but I haven't taken Greek in four years, so I'm not going to butcher that. But Athens was a great city, but it was also a very pagan city as well. Let me get this situated here. Sorry, I'm uh, having a little issue. There we go. So the narrative of Paul in Athens, it's been a very problematic passage for some people historically. Because when they read, I actually just had somebody tell me this the other day, when they read Acts 17, when they read about Paul in Athens, they, they say there's nothing gospel to it. He doesn't preach the gospel like he does when he's in other places. And I would tend to lean the other way. In fact, when I read Athens, or excuse me, Acts 17, 16 through 34, and Paul's in Athens, I not only think the gospel is present, but I think it is central to this passage. So I think specifically we can say that the gospel is central to life. And this was true for Paul everywhere he went, but when he's teaching in Athens, when he, when he is encountering different types of people in Athens, we see that the gospel is central to life. So that's kind of our big thing we want to keep in mind, that the gospel is central to life. And along with that, we see that there are three different marks, or three different truths we learn about the gospel through Paul's Athens encounter. The first one is, the gospel is a challenge. The gospel is a challenge, that's number one. Number two, the gospel provides reason. The gospel provides reason. And number three, the gospel leads to response. The gospel leads to response. So it's a challenge, it provides reason, and it leads to response. So if you have your Bibles, I'm going to read from Acts 17, 16 through 21. Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So through these verses, the gospel is a challenge. That's mark number one. You see, the gospel, Paul, everywhere he goes, he, he preaches the gospel. He proclaims Christ. So what, when this Athens account starts, he had just kind of been dropped off in Athens. He had to kind of get out of Berea and the chapters in the passages right before where we are. He was in Thessalonica as well. So Paul's been brought down, and he's kind of here. He, he's waiting his fellow workers, Silas and Timothy, as they're kind of waiting to meet him in Athens. So Paul, I have this picture in my mind that Paul's kind of wandering around the city of Athens. He's kind of doing what it, Paul normally does when he's in a city. He's exploring. And, and it says Paul's spirit is provoked. And some translations will say his spirit was distressed. And this is because that it is impossible to walk around Athens, e even nowadays, but especially back then, it's impossible to walk around the city of Athens and not see some sort of idol, not see some sort of temple that's built or dedicated to a god or goddess, or an altar that people worship a god or goddess at. So Paul sees that everywhere. In fact, there's a statistic at this time that for every single person, one person living in Athens, 
There were probably about three idols, temples, whatever you want to call it, that were in existence in the city. So there were about 30,000 idols in the city of Athens alone to just 10,000 residents. So Paul is he's distressed about this. He, he doesn't know what to make of all this. He just knows that there's something off about this. So pagan worship was clearly very prominent. So Paul was distressed by this. I mean, he was just distressed that this city had really turned to worshiping who knows what. So what does Paul do when Paul gets distressed? What does Paul always do? He begins to teach. He finds the local synagogue. He starts to teach and preach about Jesus Christ. And then in addition to the local synagogue, he finds the agora or the marketplace where all different types of people came in a city to, to shop, to, to buy what they needed. So Paul is really just beginning to preach Christ to whoever is there and his resurrection. This is pretty common for Paul. We, this is not out of the ordinary. Everywhere he goes, he, he finds places to preach, usually the synagogue, usually the marketplace. But when you get to verse 18, you see some pretty stiff objection rise up to Paul. The, the local philosophers, or the cliques, if you will, who are together, kind of, you know, view view life the same way, that they begin to rise up and they begin to question what it is that Paul is teaching. And half of these people who are listening to Paul, that they it says in the text, they think he's a babbler, they think he's a fool, he's just talking about whatever, who knows what, just kind of running his mouth a little bit. That's what they think Paul is doing. And then the ones who don't do that, they think that he's making up a new god or a new deity in this Jesus fellow. Because we know that you know, Jesus' life and his ministry was concentrated in Israel, and we're all the way over here in Athens, which is pretty far, I mean, reasonably far away. And it's reasonable to suggest that maybe they knew who Jesus was, but not in the way that Paul is teaching. So it hasn't made its way around to Athens yet. So they think he's a fool, and then the ones who don't think he's a fool think he's making up something new, which is no good in Athens. That's not a good thing. And I feel like this is a good place to stop for a second and briefly mention uh, the text mentions the Epicureans and the Stoics, which were two prominent philosophies of the day. The Epicureans, this is not a philosophy lecture, so you don't, you don't have to tense up about this because um, philosophy is kind of boring at times. But the Epicureans, they, they base their teaching, their views off of the philosopher Epicurus, which... They taught a devotion to pleasure or to comfort. Life is all about finding pleasure. It's all about finding comfort. They essentially lived really as if there was no God. And if there was a God, there's no way that you could personally know one. I mean, that's just crazy to know God personally, a God personally. They also believe that life should be absent of pain. If you experience pain in life, clearly you were not living the right way. The Stoics, on the other hand, they were a very materialistic people. It was about what you could get, about what you had. For them, there was no spiritual world. No, no spiritual world, you know, gods, goddesses, whatever. If you wanted to find a god, if you wanted to worship a god, you could worship him in this napkin right here. You could find god anywhere. Wherever you wanted to find god, that's where he was at. And happiness, you could be happy just by living a good life. If you made good choices, the right choices in life, you could be happy. That's what the Stoics taught. They also taught that any negative thought you had about the world, if you think that the world isn't perfect, then clearly you have a false perception of what reality really is. So these were the two groups that Paul is kind of being challenged by. And you see a lot in there that A, is still true today, but B, you could see why the gospel of Jesus Christ would challenge these people because it's not really exactly what it is that they're teaching. So they think Paul is a fool, verse 18, so much so that after they make fun of him and they dismiss him like, oh, pfft, I don't know what it is you're talking about. This is, not, this is not cool, Paul. They think he needs to answer to a higher authority. He, his teaching is starting to cause some problems here, and they think that he needs to answer. They hear what Paul is saying, but they don't like it because it doesn't fit their worldview. I mean, the gospel of Christ and living a life for Christ, that is not, 
not what we had in mind. So they bring Paul before what the text calls the Areopagus, which is basically a council in Athens that was comprised of prominent Athenians. They were basically a civil and religious jury in the city of Athens. So anytime somebody was starting to teach something new, religious-wise or anything, this council at Areopagus, they would listen to it. Basically, it was like being called to the principal's office. You ever been called to the principal's office when you were back, back when you were in school? Um, I'm not going to tell any stories because my parents are here about if I was ever called to the principal's office or not. Um, I wasn't. I just was going to throw that out there. But, but you can imagine, you know, going to the principal's office, you get this call, like you're going to the principal's office, and on your way, you're thinking, what did I do? I didn't do anything. Why, why does the principal need me? And then you, you appear before the principal, and the principal has the right to decide whether or not what you did warrants punishment. At least that's how I think it goes, because remember, I never went. Uh, wink, wink. Um, so it's like Paul's going to a principal's office. That's kind of what is going on here. He isn't being arrested, per se, but this council, this Areopagus council, they're going to be very interested to hear what Paul has to say because he's either talking about nothing and he's just causing a commotion down in the marketplace or he's introducing a new God. Either way, Paul needs to answer for what he did. So in Athens, I want to describe to you a little a bit about the ancient city of Athens. You, maybe most of you have heard of the famous Acropolis, which is a very high hill that sits at the top of the city. It's visible to most parts of the city. Well, the marketplace in Athens was just at the foot of this hill, meaning if you were standing on top of the Acropolis, you could see down to the marketplace, you could see everything that was going on. And so this Areopagus Council is probably meeting somewhere just off the top of the Acropolis, um, Ares Hill or Mars Hill are the two primary locations they probably would have met. So they can see that Paul, this guy, is teaching something down in the marketplace that is causing a little bit of a disruption. So they, they, want, they want to see him. So Paul is brought before the council, and it's important to note that the, in the Athenian world, introducing new deities or new religions, that was no bueno. See, that was my attempt at doing Spanish, no bueno. Greek, Spanish, yeah. bilingual, probably, maybe not. Um, but introducing these new deities, it was not good. It wasn't advised. And religion played a very prominent role in the society of Athens. And so for somebody, an outsider at that, like Paul was, to introduce something new in their midst, that wasn't good. That wasn't good. So Paul is really up against it here. He's already about to appear before a council who basically probably doesn't really want to hear what he has to say. But Luke, who is the author of Acts, I love how he phrases this. He gives a ringing endorsement about these people in Athens in verse 21. Basically said they spent their time in nothing, they, did, they didn't do anything except they, they talked and they basically listened. Um, they were very into what was new. They were trendy before it was a thing. Like They loved to hear new things. Didn't necessarily want to adopt it, but they loved to hear what you had to say. So Paul begins to preach in Athens, okay? And he's preaching in the synagogue. He, he's preaching, this is the first scene. Synagogue, the marketplace, and he ruffles a few feathers because... Would it be a Paul encounter anywhere if he didn't ruffle a few feathers? So the gospel is poking into the common worldviews of the Athenian philosophers and probably some of the other devout religious people that were there. Because he starts off in the synagogue, which who resides in the synagogue? It, it's the Jewish people. And we know there was a lot of Jewish hostility to the gospel back then as well. So Paul is really challenging a lot of different types of people here. Because the gospel is a challenge. And we see that at the beginning of this narrative, that the gospel is a challenge. It's a challenge to worldviews. It's a challenge to different ways of life. And it's a challenge to those who oppose it. The gospel is a challenge. So moving on in the text, we see that the next mark of the gospel is that the gospel provides reason. The gospel provides reason. Let's read Acts 17, 22 through 29 now. 
So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. So now Paul is before the Areopagus, okay? He, he's before them, and he doesn't wait to be asked. He just launches right into his message, okay? I appreciate this about Paul. Like he, he appears before this strange group of people, and he doesn't even waste a second before he starts talking about what it is that he wants to talk about. He's a driver. He's a very straightforward person. He recognizes the Athenian devotion to religion. It was a religious society. He starts off his address by saying, Men of Athens, I perceive that you are very religious people. You, you worship, okay? You're kind of like, you're definitely not worshiping the right thing, but, but you're religious people, okay? He's establishing common ground with these people. In fact, he mentions a rather famous inscription that he saw in the city of Athens. It's reasonable to suggest that as he was walking around through the city, he sees this altar that, there, that exists in Athens, and the altar says, to an unknown god. Basically, they built something to worship a god that they don't even know. That's pretty crazy to me. That's what they did. And it's probably reasonable to also say that whatever this unknown god was, the Athenians knew what Paul was talking about. This is a pivotal point in this passage because the Greeks are convinced right, that this rather famous inscription or this rather famous altar to this unknown god, they're convinced that God can't be known or that this god can't be unknown. And Paul uses that to say, actually, let me tell you about the one true god who can be known. And that's kind of how he starts his address. If you look at verse 24, you see that this particular God that Paul is talking about, the true God, he first and foremost is the creator. God is active everywhere, and he doesn't live in temples made by human hands. And these claims are important for two reasons. Paul is addressing these people in a city, Athens. It's hard to even describe how many different temples there are, the different gods and goddesses. Man-made temples that are built to worship a god or a goddess. And Paul is saying, God doesn't live in temples like that. He's not in temples made by human hands. He's everywhere. On top of that, Paul is literally giving this address probably right next to one of the most famous landmarks in the entire world, the Acropolis that I mentioned early on. He's probably, it's probably just you know, to his left, to his right, but definitely within visual shot. And he's saying, look, God doesn't live in temples like this. What's at the Acropolis? Literally temples that are devoted to the gods. And Paul is saying, no, God does not live in a place like that. It's, Paul's using that as an illustration. And by saying that God also is here and he's active everywhere, it's a direct attack or a shot at the Epicureans who believe that God can't be known. Paul's saying, yes, he actually can be known. And to the Stoics who believe that God cannot be found outside of material things. You know, God, God could be in the piano. You know, that, that's what Stoics believed. And Paul's like, no, he, he's not there either. He's everywhere. He's always active. He's with us right now. Paul is directly teaching something that is going to go directly against these two prominent worldviews. 
And also by saying that God isn't served by human hands, it's also a shot at all the Greeks here, the Athenians, who have literally built a religious system based on what can they do for God, what can they sacrifice to God, what can they build for God. That's how they built their system. And, and Paul is saying, no, no, you, you, don't, you don't understand. You don't build things for God. You don't give to God. God is the creator. He is the life giver. You wouldn't have a life if it weren't for God. Amen, absolutely. I always like when I get an amen. That's always really, that's always really fun. Uh, yes, Paul is saying to everyone present, your view of God, it's, it's wrong, it's off base, because what, it's not big enough. You think that God can only be found in certain places, and Paul is saying, no, 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 God can be found everywhere. He is always present with you because God is the life giver. He's the sustainer. But Paul isn't done. He continues into verses 26 and 27 by saying, you know what, God created the entire human race through one man. God is also in charge of time. Nothing happens outside of his watch. There are no accidents. He created everyone and everything for a specific purpose. Paul delves deeper into the worldview of the Athenians also by mentioning, you know, you kind of seek, they prod around for their gods there in the text, like, oh, we're searching for God. Maybe, maybe today we can find favor with God, or maybe today we can be blessed by the gods. They're, they're searching for something. However, the one true God is always near us. You don't have to search very far to find him if you are truly searching. See, I am even convinced that even today the human race is constantly seeking some sort of God or some sort of idol. But the question is, what are you finding? Are you finding the one true God? Or are you finding a God-like substitute? And this is no doubt another affront to the Athenian religious system. Greek gods and goddesses, by their very nature, seem like they would be very impersonal, right? Seemed like they'd be impersonal. If it were me, I'd probably turn over. If I were Paul, I'd probably be a little bit more petty than Paul was about this. I would turn to the Acropolis and be like, oh, there's the world-famous Parthenon over there, which is the temple to Athena, who, who's the, the uh, Athens goddess. And I would be like, hey, Athena, maybe you could come out and do some god stuff today. You know, you think maybe we can find favor with you today? It sounds ridiculous, but that's how the Athenians felt. That's how they operated. They went to the temples to, to worship and thinking that maybe, maybe today was the day they could find favor. But Paul is presenting the real, true God in a way that is very reasonable, but very different from the Athenians and, and their way of life, the way of life and for the Greeks. And, and through the gospel, because I truly believe this is a gospel message, and I'll get to that in a second, Paul is providing reason to these very devout and very religious Greeks. They're on the right track, okay? They understand the importance of a quote-unquote, worship in a religious system, but they're just not worshiping the right things. So Paul is trying to present God as he knows him, as the creator first and foremost. And make no mistake, I truly believe this. Understanding God first and foremost as the creator is central and imperative to the gospel message. If God didn't create life, then everything that follows is, isn't, isn't significant. God is first and foremost a creator, which is how Paul is presenting him here. So this presentation by Paul, it actually sounds similar. It echoes similar language. In fact, he could have had this on the mind as he was saying this, Psalm 145. And I just want to read a few verses out of Psalm 145, specifically 18 through 21. And just, I think it connects a lot to what we have seen. The Lord is near to all who call on him. To all who call on him in truth, he fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord, and let all flesh bless his holy name forever. See, no more searching, no more wandering. Why? Because God is right here. Amen. Paul continues to drive forward his point by saying in verse 28, our very existence, the reason we are here, is rooted in God. Right? Verse 28 reads, For in him we live and move and have our being. Okay, He's quoting right there 
um, probably, most likely, it sounds like Job 12.10, um, which speaks back in Job how, how our lives are in the hands of God. Everything about our lives. Paul even goes so far in the second half of verse 28, he quotes Greek poetry, and this is the part that a lot of people have a problem with. Why is Paul using Greek poetry to, to describe God? Well, because this particular Greek poem was probably written to most likely Zeus, who, who was one of the premier gods of the Greeks. But it was probably, if not to Zeus, it was another prominent god this poem was written to. And it says, For we are indeed his offspring. So Paul's point isn't to condone the message of Greek poetry to say that, yes, writing poems to your gods and goddesses, that's okay, you keep doing that. But Paul is saying that even the Greeks and their poems are looking for meaning and they're looking for po purpose. And, and they know that they have come from something. But what they view, their view is wrong. It's inaccurate. They didn't come from Zeus. So in verse 29, Paul again makes reference to the images and the things that the Greeks have created from their hands to the hands of God, their gods. Gold or silver or stone, images that, that have been created by man, formed by the art and imagination. They have missed it, okay? Because the true God cannot be worshipped by the things made by human hands. They've erected all these temples to their gods and goddesses. But the Israelites tried this once too. Not necessarily with the temple, but in Exodus 32 with a golden calf. All right? they, they, built this, they created this golden calf to worship. And if you know anything about the story of the golden calf in Exodus 32, you know that that didn't go over so well with God. And neither will the religious pluralism that is on display in Athens. Because it's incompatible with the true God. See, all of these beautiful man-made temples, if you go to Greece, you see this even in Turkey, uh, really everywhere of the ancient world. You see all these temples. They're, they're beautiful displays of architecture. But these temples are more real than the gods or goddesses that they have been built for. That's what Paul is trying to get across. Biblical scholar and commentator, he, he wrote a book on Acts, had this to say about, about this. Imagination and artistic skill can produce works of art, but not God. The God who created the universe and the human race, the God whom Paul proclaims to the Athenians, is not like these human productions, and certainly not identical with them. God is not like these, these man-made objects, right? You can't find God in that, and that's not quite the proper way to worship God, at least in this context. So Paul does his best to reason with the Athenians. All right, he's reasoning with them. He lays out this picture of who God is. Not the God of the Greeks, but the one true God. The God of the Israelites. The God of Exodus. And at this point in time, the God who ultimately was incarnated in the person of Jesus Christ. He's reasoning with them. He's laying this out. The creator, the life giver, the sustainer, the sovereign one who holds all life. But he is reasoning with them, and honestly, he wants them to find their purpose and, and the God. He wants them to find their reason and the reason that we are all here, and that's God. In an intellectual city like Athens that was guided by reason and guided by what was reasonable to believe and what knowledge could we possess, Paul is saying that there is nothing that is smarter or more reasonable than worshiping the true God, the Creator. So that brings us to the third and final mark of the gospel, and that's that the gospel leads to response. The gospel leads to response. Acts 17.30, through the end of the chapter. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst. But some men joined him and believed, among 
whom also were Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. So this is the end of Paul's time in Athens. This, this kind of concludes his, his time there. And, you know, look, he wants everyone listening and who's around to know that, you know, God calls everyone everywhere to genuine repentance. God could have flat out condemned everyone for their consistent and persistent religious worship, for their ignorance, but he chose not to. And honestly, when it came to this type of pagan worship and this type of ignorance that is being described here, Athens probably would have been at the hot top of the list, okay? Everything that had went on in the city, the different worldviews, the different gods, the different goddesses, they would have been really high on this list if, if we were keeping score on those things. But God chooses not to condemn, and it's all because of Jesus. Verse 31 talks of this appointed judge, the one who was resurrected from the dead. And by this resurrection, all can have assurance that this judge, this judge that's mentioned, who's going to judge the whole world, okay, he's pretty legit. He's legitimate, okay? We don't have to worry about his credentials. And he isn't mentioned by name, but is there any doubt that this is Jesus Christ? Because through his death and resurrection, God has offered the chance at repentance. Uh, he's offered the chance to be made right with God. And given that fact, I would say that when it comes to this, repentance is a pretty good response to the gospel. Wouldn't you agree? And the problem was that the Areopagus Council here, they were very high on theories and knowledge, but they weren't very high on action. To them, this was just chatter. This is just another religious exercise that Paul's presenting. So much so that in verse 32, some of them hear all of this from Paul. Paul lays this out. This is who God is. And you know what they still do? They mock him. The concept of a resurrection, first and foremost, it was pretty ludicrous in Greek thought. Like, people don't rise from the dead. Are you kidding me? And if, if you were also God, why would you even be dying in the first place? So this is ludicrous to them. Like, they mock him. Like, this is just chatter, Paul. Like, what are you actually saying here? And the ones who didn't mock him, they don't understand. Like he says all of this, and they don't really hear him very well or don't understand it to the point where, can you tell us more about this? Like, we, we kind of see what you're saying, but we're still kind of lost here. Tell us a little more. So Paul's two responses, he, he gets mocked and he gets indifference. So what does Paul do? Does, does he keep talking to them? Does he continue on? Does he, does he press on? No. He doesn't force the issue. He actually leaves. He leaves the situation. He said what he needed to say. Paul's like, well, I presented it to them, and they're not really hearing it. I'm not getting a good response here. So he just leaves. He leaves Athens. But I love the ending to this account. Because a lot of people will suggest that Paul's time in Athens, when he preached the gospel, he was a witness. It, it was kind of a failure because he didn't get the mass conversion that we read other places in Acts. But he does get conversion. It wasn't a complete bust. The Spirit of God did move on hearts, and there are two individuals mentioned by name in this passage. Dionysius, who was a member of the council, he was an Areopagite. You want to keep him, his name in the back of your mind because we'll come back to him. And a woman named Damaris. So they, along with others, those are the only two mentioned by name, but it does say other people... They did respond to the gospel. They, they were converted. Why? Well, because the gospel, it does lead to response. Okay, And I'm truly convinced that when you hear the gospel, you either respond positively to it or you respond negatively. I don't think there's too much in between. The gospel really it, it demands response. How could you hear that and not make a decision one way or the other? So during the brief time that Paul spent in Athens, we, we see overall, I believe, that the way Paul operates, not just here in Athens, but really anywhere he goes in the book of Acts, that the gospel is central to life. The gospel is central to life. And we see Paul interweave this message. We, we see him interweave this into all aspects of life. But along with that, we see that the gospel challenges. It challenges the worldviews. 
It, it challenged people who were religious in other ways. The gospel provides reason. It's very, very compatible with a lot of ways of life, if you really think about it. But you you got to do it right. you you got to be worshiping the right God. It, we're all searching. So the gospel provides reason, and, and the gospel leads to response, okay? Positive response in the form of conversion, or negative response to the form of ridicule, mockery, um, lack of understanding, what, whatever the case may be. And off of this, I believe that there are actually two primary ways that I believe we can we can take this because this is kind of a it's a story, it's a narrative, but we can take this and, and live it out day to day. And the first way is to seek to know more about God, to seek to know more about God. Uh, one of our prof- professors at Grace has a saying. He, he said it the first day I ever had class with him at Grace. And it's stuck with me through all this time that I've been there. And he says, we are teaching you to know the word of God. But we also want you to know the God of the word. Yes. We, are, we are teaching you to know the God, word of God. But we also want you to know the God of the word. And I believe that the more you learn and know more about God, the better chance you have at life transformation. Because we have another professor who says, friends, to know him is to love him. And you can just feel, you can feel the passion that Paul has about when he teaches about God or when he talks about it. You can feel this passion. Okay, this is not a generic, monotone, hi, I'm Paul, let me tell you about what I've learned. No, this is Paul reasoning. He is establishing common ground. He is doing whatever it takes to be a bold witness for Christ because he's passionate about it. He knows about God. He's learning about God. And he wants other people to come alongside him in that endeavor. I know recently you just, um, I think, went through 2 Timothy couple weeks through 2 Timothy. Timothy was a great example of somebody who was a beneficiary of Paul's passion for these things. And you always have to seek to know more about God. I think if you're, if you're growing in your faith, you're probably learning something about God. And there are a lot of good books about this. I mean, there's a lot of things you could read. I've read a lot about this lately, but I am still convinced that the best place to know more and learn about God is right here, God's word. Because this is God's special revelation. This is how he has revealed himself right here. So if you want to learn about God, why wouldn't you go straight to the source? Always seek to know more about God. The second thing that you can do is let your life be a witness. Okay, Let your life be a witness. Because I think this Acts passage, it's appropriately relevant for where we are today. See, we have various worldviews that exist today. Some say that there is no God. And if there is a God, he's not significant for your day-to-day lives, so we're just going to kind of live the way we want to live. We have philosophies, all these different things that either put you over here on this side of the stage or that put you over here on this side of the stage. Nothing in between. Different worldviews that could not possibly be compatible. Very similar to what Paul is experiencing in Athens. And there's an increasing amount of tension towards the gospel and towards just even saying the name Jesus Christ. There's a lack of a proper understanding about who God is. But one thing we always notice about Paul, and it's especially true in Athens, is that he's always faithful with his message. But even more so than that, he's faithful with his life. His life was such a great witness that he had no problems proclaiming God and proclaiming Christ and his resurrection to anyone or anywhere he went. And I have to ask, what about you? If you were brought before this council like Paul was, it could be an intimidating thing. Obviously, this probably doesn't even rank in the top five of Paul's encounters with authorities. But nonetheless, he still gets in front of them and he still walks them through who God is, what God has done how God is significant for your life now. What about you? Would would you be able to preach that same message? Better yet, would your life reflect that same message? And you know what? I'm going to be honest with you. It's quite easy to be deterred 
as a witness for God, it's quite easy to be discouraged, especially nowadays. You may not see many people come to Christ. You could give this great gospel presentation. You could live your life wholly devoted to God, and you still may not see people converted because of it. But that doesn't mean that God isn't working. Your role is to be a faithful witness. That's what the whole book of Acts centers around. It's people being spirit-empowered witnesses. You let God worry about convert people and the spirit moving on people's hearts. You just continue to follow God. You continue to be a faithful witness for him. But, you know, I'm sure that Paul, as a hum- he's a human after all. I'm sure that he would have loved, he gave this great presentation to the men of Athens, okay? He reasoned with them. He used their own things that they'd be familiar with to try to build his argument. From a witness stand, from an evangelistic standpoint, Paul would get an A plus for this presentation, right? If he's giving it to a professor, he'd get an A plus. But what was his first what were the first responses? He was mocked. He was ridiculed. I'm sure he was probably hoping for a few more converts. He's probably he could be thinking about, you know, when Peter preached at Pentecost and thousands were added to the number, okay? Like, why can't I be more like Peter? And how he does it. But Paul doesn't do that. But it is human nature. But Paul continued just to be a faithful witness regardless. But you know, it's kind of funny how God works. So one of the converts in Athens that is mentioned by name, Dionysius, the Areopagite, had had a very interesting life after his conversion. He hears Paul. He's a member of this council. Who knows what he believed before. It could have been anything, really. But he hears Paul, he's converted, and it is believed historically in church history that Dionysius became the first bishop of the church at Athens. In fact, today he's actually considered a saint in the Roman Catholic Church, as well as the Eastern Orthodox Church. He achieved sainthood, and, and he, he was just a normal, everyday Athenian before Paul came along. And it's because Paul was a faithful witness, you know? I mean, Paul is a faithful witness. He, he, he shared this message. Dionysius was converted. But it's really all because of how God worked. And, and I just want to ask this question. I want to pose this question. Does God do amazing things through the gospel, or does God do amazing things through the gospel? Amen. 2,000 years ago, Greek was a pagan nation. Greece was a pagan nation that, that led the way in pagan worship. A lot of those elements are still left over today in terms of temples that they brought up and, and all these shrines and all these things. It was a pagan nation. But does anyone know what the major religion in Greece is today? It's Eastern Orthodox Christianity. And has anyone seen the official flag of Greece? Anyone know what the official flag of Greece looks like? Well, I happen to have a miniature version with me this morning because I always collect flags where I, of countries I visit. And does anyone notice the symbol in the top left-hand corner of the Greek flag? It's a cross. It's a cross. And the cross is there because Christianity is the most established religion and most practiced faith in the entire country of Greece. So much so that they put a cross on their national flag. Isn't that pretty crazy that for years, a country that was known historically, major player in world history, they were known for anything but being Christian. And nowadays, it's so Christian that they put a cross on their flag. Isn't that pretty crazy? Just 2,000 years, which in the grand scheme of things is not you know, in a crazy long period of time. Because the Lord has used people like Paul, who were faithful witnesses, to facilitate Who knows how many conversions in Greece as well as other countries? Who knows how many people that Dionysius, being the first bishop in the church of Athens, which is the central city in Greece, who knows how Paul used him and people that he influenced and that they influenced all the way down the line? Who knows how God has used these things to bring people to him? We don't know, but God knows. And it's pretty reasonable to say that the way that God works through faithful witnesses, like a Paul, like a Dionysius, is pretty significant and it's pretty remarkable, even today. 
So when it looks like God isn't working, know that he is always working. He is always working. And the Lord's gospel, his gospel, his message, it's central to life. All right? There is no life without it. There's no eternal life without it. The Lord saves. Does the Lord save? Absolutely. He uses faithful witnesses. He uses your life. He uses maybe the lives of people that, that you impact. He clearly at some point in time probably used the life of the person that impacted you. God uses a variety of different means but the same message, and he requires the same thing, and that's genuine repentance. But his gospel is central to life, and that's what I believe Paul shows us through his account in Athens. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your truth. We thank you for your gospel. Lord, we thank you for the ways that you use your your witnesses, such as Paul, who who knows how many people have, have come to a saving knowledge of you, you know, through um, the Spirit, obviously, writing through Paul in, in our New Testament. God, who knows how many people that you brought to yourself through Dionysius or, or through whoever it may be that once heard and once understood that the gospel, it saves, it's powerful, Lord, and then it also becomes central. Lord, thank you for giving us your word, your gospel. Thank you for giving us Jesus Christ, through whom we can say that we have been made right with you. We have been reconciled to you, God. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.